unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grand Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in the Hindustan Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. Water is everywhere, in the highest mountains, in the deepest ocean, in the Ganga, in sewers, within you, and in the air. But the glass of water in front of you is precious because it requires India's volatile, varied water to be harnessed and brought to you in your home. This is one of the main insights of the new book, Watershed, How We Destroyed India's Water and How We Can Save It, by the author Midula Ramesh. Ramesh is the founder of the Sundaram Climate Institute. She's also a clean tech investor and a leading public voice in India's water and climate debates. Her new book gives readers a 360-degree perspective on India's water woes and how they can be addressed. I am very pleased to welcome her to the show for the very first time. Nice to talk to you. Thank you, Milan. Great to be here. So there is a lot in this book that you cover, and I want to make sure that we do justice to as much of it as possible. But just by way of introduction, I want to start with your story. I'd love to hear a little bit about your own evolution so our listeners kind of have a sense of the unique set of perspectives you bring to bear when it comes to the questions of, of, of water. So tell us a little bit about how you came to this subject. Yeah, like so many other Indians, I lived in complete ignorance of water and water was invisible to me, right, until we ran out of water at home. And having to grapple with that, you know, it water became visible and having to respect it and learn about it. And most importantly, understand that it became my responsibility to deal with it, uh, I think is where the book really starts. So uh, in that sense, I'm not talking from a pedestal. I'm not saying I know it, you don't. It's it's very much uh, the my starting point was where every other Indian, dare I say, many other humans in this world start from. But I think a couple of things helped and shaped uh, my journey in water. The first is a training in science. So I, uh, you know, I studied science, chemistry and microbiology in Cornell. And, you know, uh, the training of uh, just being driven by scientific understanding of the subject and being comfortable with experimentation and data and being driven by what the data tells you is very important. The second thing is my management training. I've spent over two decades in, corp in the corporate world, first in McKinsey and then in a uh, factory, uh, you know, <clears throat> in manufacturing. And that gave me three lenses which I apply to this problem. One is pragmatism, right? Let's not make the perfect the enemy of what is feasible. So what works is important. Second is incentives. I think in crafting any solution, we need all perspectives. And most importantly, we need to keep the incentives of those effecting any solution in mind. Uh, the third thing is uh, the factory I work in is one of the uh, first companies, uh, textile companies in the world to win the JIPM TPM award. And that data is our God, right? We track every piece of data and we are driven by any action we take with data. So, you know, that really shapes the way I think about water. So when we came to day zero, as it were, when we completely ran out of uh, groundwater at home and we didn't have municipal water, so we were forced to buy tanker water, which is uh, basically water that comes on private vehicles and you have to pay a very high price. Um, we realized we first, like so many of us, we didn't know how much water we were using and what we were using it for. So, you know, just getting data on it. So uh, we have 15 meters at home, just measuring the water. And that gave us insights. And only then did we act. We didn't say, oh, we have to do this. We have to do that. We didn't go around like a bull in a china shop trying different things. We got the data and then acted. I think uh, that, that set of uh, principles is what guides my journey to water and understanding it. And when you mentioned day zero, just so our listeners know, you're referring to the day when you came home, I think it was in 2013 in Madurai in Tamil Nadu, and, and literally had no water coming out of the tap. Um, you know, you write early on in the framing of the book that India's water is especially precious because we are essentially asking one fifth of the world's population 
to survive on less than one thirtieth of the world's water, right? Which is a pretty stunning statistic when you kind of sit back and, and, and take that in. As a result, of course, uh, it will not come as much of a surprise uh, that you conclude, you know, India's water is in a state of crisis. I know this can be sort of hard to boil down because it's such a big and complicated subject, For but for those um, who are unaware, for who are uninitiated, who did not experience a day zero, tell us why you say up front that water and the sustainability of water in India is in such bad shape. No, Milan, I think that's a great question. And I think I'll, I'll use an analogy of a human relationship. And I think what India has is a dysfunctional relationship with its water. And as in any human relationships, there are two aspects that make this relationship dysfunctional. One is a lack of understanding. See, India's water is one of the most varied and one of the most volatile in the world. Um, you know, there are places in Rajasthan, like Jaisalmer, which get just 165 millimeters of water, of rain a year. And then on the other side of con the country, in the Northeast, you get meters of rainfall falling in a matter of months. You know, there are, there's a study by the World Resources Institute that says, you know, of 166 countries that they studied, India's water is more seasonal then, you know, 162 countries. Uh, when I was doing my research for the book, uh, I learned that most of India's rainfall falls in 100 hours, right? There's a graph I have in the book which shows the number of days on which it rains across cities in the world, and India's cities are just outliers. And it varies across years because India's monsoon is driven by global factors like El Nino, the Indian Ocean Dipole, and other factors that vary over time. So you have this highly variable being, and then you try and reduce it to a plain vanilla. So there's a lack of understanding that underlies every dysfunctional relationship. And we got it once, and we don't now. So that's one. But there's a second thing, right? We don't respect our water. And that's separate from a lack of understanding. And um, as a proxy for respect, I'll say value, right? Value means price. And what I've learned in just looking at Indian history is that throughout history, whether you look at uh, the Chanakyas, uh, Arthashastra, you look at how uh, crops, uh, taxes were paid in the past, there was always a price that Indians paid for water. Either it was a price paid in kind, to be sure, and uh, sometimes it was a price paid by labor. But today, you know, we've just, water has become this entrenched, there's a deeply emotional belief that water should be free. And that often translates to a lack of respect. So like in a dysfunctional relationship, you've just made water both invisible and you don't understand it. I just want to go back to this paradox that you just mentioned in your book brings this out beautifully, right? Which is there are two separate crises of water quantity in India, right? In some places, there is too much water, while in others, there is an acute scarcity. Now, from somebody who's not a scientist who looks at this, right, your initial thought is, okay, there must be some way of balancing these out, right? Because you have surplus and scarcity. Is there a way to even this out? What's the right way of thinking about sort of water management? Is there a way for India to sort of harness this to its benefit? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great question. And it's not even in different cities. I mean, you take Chennai, right? Same city. 2015, you have a flood where, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands pe of people are marooned. And then in 2019, you have this horrible drought where, you know, the uh, people were getting water once in four days. There were some, you know, not getting water at all. It was It was horrific. And it's the same city, right? And there is only one reason for that. And that's, again, acknowledging that India's water is so variable. And if you have something that goes up and down, up and down, how do you even adapt? Storage. You know, that's the, that's the thing we had. Like, if you take every city in India, it was a city of lakes, of man-made cascading tanks. Uh, I was... Um, you know, quite fascinated to learn that Mumbai, Bombay, had 3,000 tanks and wells, you know, in the early 19th century. Delhi has tanks, uh, Chennai has tanks, Bengaluru has tanks, Madurai has tanks. And why were these tanks 
so prolific because they were wonderful to store water in right during uh, intense bout of rainfall they provided a place for the water to flow into and that recharged the groundwater like the studies in sundaram climate institute we've studied over 100 tanks and found if you have a functional tank it raises groundwater levels by about 200 feet so you know it is a beautiful uh, traditional piece of engineering that balances out this volatility elegantly you, you note in the book and this is again another stunning statistic that i, I did not know India pulls more water out of the ground each year than China and the United States do combined, which is really one of those things when you read, you sort of stop and think, is this a stunning factoid? You know, the downside consequences of this, I think, are probably fairly obvious. But what are the causes of this? Is it simply India has an inefficient system of agriculture? Why is this stress on groundwater so pronounced? Uh, in this country? No, again, fantastic question. Um, so here's the thing, right? If you, um, you know, every few years, the Central Groundwater Board of India publishes a report on how the estimate groundwater resources are used, right? And 89% of groundwater is used in agriculture. So certainly, you know, solving the making agricultural groundwater extraction more sustainable would go some ways to solving the problem. But solving, let's say, the groundwater extraction in northwest India is going to do precious little about the exhaustion of groundwater uh, in the peripheries of Bangalore. So yes, agriculture is critical, but you know, because of the geographic variability, you have to solve all parts of the puzzle, so to speak. But then going back, um, I think going back to agriculture and uh, just looking at, you know, why why we do this. Again, it, it you know, I look at the historical causes of uh, why Punjab and Haryana and Western UP do this. You're trying to grow a crop which requires 1,240 millimeters of rainfall in a place that gets between 40, uh, 400 and 600 millimeters of rainfall. And you're bridging that gap in rainfall. And, and that's just uh, rice, right? And then you're adding wheat to that. And you're bridging the gap with groundwater largely, right? And uh, I'll tell you the really scary bit in that the latest report by the Central Groundwater Board, there's an annexure okay, with a state level committee in Punjab saying, look, if this current trends continue, we're going to exhaust groundwater in the next 20 to 25 years. And what is the impact of that? Now, that's the breadbasket of India, right? And that, I mean, really, thanks to Punjabi, Haryanvi uh, farmers, India has become food secure. Now, if uh, groundwater is not there, we're not going to be able to grow those crops there anymore. Uh, and uh, the food security of India gets called into question. So that's that's one impact of that. The second part, which is if you take cities, and when cities start exhausting groundwater, like our groundwater ran out, right? So I'm fully cognizant of what happens. Your life really gets turned upside down when that happens. And um, unless you learn to manage it, uh, you're going to start seeing climate migrants. Uh, simply people just moving out of certain parts of cities into other parts. And as things become more and more serious, you're going to start movement, seeing, you know, movement across the country. And both of these, um, I would say, makes the future more uh, unsettled, to say the least. So you mentioned three geographic areas that are very interesting. Uh, Haryana, Punjab, Western UP. Uh, not coincidentally, they were also the hotbed of the recent farmers' protest that succeeded in uh, forcing the government to repeal three controversial farm laws, farm reform bills. Uh, we've talked about that on the podcast before. Um, farmers in these areas that you mentioned, uh, you know, are often referred to as part of the breadbasket. They have traditionally been amongst the most successful farming communities. Also, the ones, though, that have performed or employed the most water intensive practices. Are we missing part of this 
in this debate, in this discussion, the sort of environmental angle of what these farm protests and maybe the consequences of the farm protests are? Because we talk a lot about what it means for livelihoods. We talk about a lot about what it means for minimum support prices, You know what it means for, for political uh, strategy and, and, and election outcomes. But how do you think about the recent debate and, and, and what the environmental or climate ramifications are? That's the billion, trillion dollar question, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, to answer that, um, uh, it was fascinating, Milan. I mean, really, when you go back in time in Punjab, and I was very fortunate to find a set of studies which studied what Indus Valley fa- farmers had grown over a thousand years, right? So these scientists, archaeobotanists, had extracted hundreds of seeds, dated them, and then figured out what farmers grew where. And farmers in that time really grew, they matched crop to water availability. And then, uh, I mean, incidentally, they matched city to water availability as well, which is why Mohan Jataro looks so different from Bolavira, for instance. And they were rewarded for that, right? And that, that sustainability of crop choice continues largely through a large part of Indian history. The most significant break, there were other breaks, uh, you know, short, smaller breaks, but the most significant break with this comes when the British come. And the British cleared, you know, when you take Punjab, uh, they cleared the river valleys of forest. They brought uh, canals bringing water in. They had railways taking water out. And I think that schism uh, really introduced in Indian minds for the first time that water variability did not matter and technology could overcome it, right? So that schism came in, and that's when the Punjab, Punjab was the place where all this experimentation was primarily happening. So the uh, the Punjab farmer really began to believe, like, look, I can grow what I want as long as I can get technology to uh, make me whole. And then, of course, came the Green Revolution, right? So in the Green Revolution, what we, uh, you know, at the Green Revolution came in a time in 64, 65, and India was, you know, as I quoted another person saying, living ship to mouth. They, they, it was back-to-back droughts. There was no food. And uh, the, the Americans were keeping India on a tight leash, saying, look, we'll give you grain as long as you do what we say. And uh, it was seen as paramount for India to become food secure. And water seemed plentiful, right? At that time, when I spoke to a bureaucrat, studying those things. He said, look, at that time, we, the Bakranangal canal was coming up. You know, we really thought water was going to be plentiful. And so, you know, when you look at how the electricity tariffs changed, and I've talked about it in the book, they were flattened and then they were cheapened. And farmers were told, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can grow what you want, just maximize your crop productivity. And so they did. And then you fast forward another 20 years, in 2009, and uh, you know, the groundwater is running out even then. And then there comes an act to try and preserve groundwater, which postpones the sowing by a couple of weeks. And now suddenly the gap between the rice harvest and the wheat har- uh, planting shrinks to less than two weeks. And the crop harvester, which is essentially the machine that harvests the grain, uh, leaves stubble on the ground, Right. And uh, the quickest way and to and the cheapest way to get rid of the stubble is to burn it, and which contributes substantially to uh, the winter North Indian winter air pollution spike. Right. So you've come full circle. You've said, you know what? You've been taught like you can do what you want. This the environment is fine, and step by step by step, and now the crisis of water has become a crisis of air, and. In 20 to 25 years, the water is going to dry out as well. So there are two consequences, right? So if you look at environmental consequences, there's food security of India, which is environmental, but it's also like a very important geopolitical consequence. There's the pollution consequence to the North Indian winters. But what about the next generation of Punjabi, Haryani and uh, Haryanvi and Western UP farmers? If they exhaust their groundwater, what are they going to grow?
Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. What I find so interesting about this conversation is this is a book on water, and we've touched on about a dozen hot button issues, uh, pollution, climate, food security, health, education, livelihoods, right? I mean, you can really see how this is linked to so many subjects. I, I want to just come back again to another thing you mentioned before, and it's another political economy dimension of this crisis, right? Um, you talk a lot in the book about managing demand demand for water. And at the core of the problem, it seems, is the fact that water is not valued or priced properly, right? And you you have this to say in the book that water departments on average charge about 46 pese for each rupee of water they provide. Um, I, I imagine if you talk to many ordinary Indians, they would be willing to pay more for water if they could receive some kind of reassurance from the government about quality, reliability, and so on. What do we know about the willingness of ordinary Indian citizens to make this trade-off? Is there any evidence suggesting this is how they would react? And if so, why hasn't this been a bigger preoccupation for policymakers? No, they they charge 46 paise and then their collection efficiency is pretty low. So they actually collect a lot <laughs> less, which is why, you know, they're, they're, uh, Even less. They're not, their financial uh, statements are not very appealing. Um, but, you know, Milan... Uh, there is a embedded assumption there that Indians are willing to pay, yeah. right? And what we really do in Sundaram Climate Institute is say, we don't know. Yeah. Let's go and ask people, right? right? So one of the studies that uh, uh, my book relies upon is this just talking to, uh, you know, I think now we're well over 2,000 households and ask them questions, exactly the question that you're asking now and hear what they respond. So in, in we spoke to over 2,000 households, right? And we got an answer for the question, would you pay a meaningful price for 24 by 7 water on tap good quality, right? 949 people gave us an answer, and most said no. Most said no. Only a quarter most said, said no, they, they would not be most willing. Most said no. Yeah, they would not be willing. And, you know, I've gone back and forth on this thing, trying to understand why. So let me just break that down a little bit. Uh, only a quarter said they were willing to pay a meaningful water price, right? But if you split that by the frequency at which they get water, I mean, for the listeners outside India, and maybe even listeners within India, most Indians don't get water on tap every day. So, you know, the section who got water every day only 10% were willing to pay a meaningful price for water. And that makes sense, right? I'm getting water, I'm not paying much for it, so why should I pay now? anything more, right? You're not going to change anything. For people who are getting water less frequently than once in three days, only a third were willing to pay water, right? So I think that is that just puts paid to a lot of the, you know, it answers your question, why are politicians not very interested in it? Well, they're like, well, we know the reality. They're not, this is not an election issue. And then, you know, something I talk about in the book is in, in again, this 900 people we spoke to, we said, would you, would water in any way, shape or form influence your vote? And again, most people said, no, it wouldn't. Right. And I think that's something to take away because, uh, and that, partially explains why it's um, uh, politically not as salient as it might be. Let me just kind of link with what you just said with um, passage in your book, which is about what, which is about sort of money and technology and interaction, right? You, you sort of talk about towards the end of the book, how do we build water resilience in India, right? And and, and one of the, the things you say is that, look, neither money nor technology are the binding constraints, right? Which is kind of runs opposite to what we sometimes hear. 
you say rather it's about the incentives of a given technology's users. And I was wondering if you could kind of double down on that a little bit and unpack this for us, maybe illustrate with example. What what are you referring to when you say it's really not about money technology, but the incentives of a given technology's users? You know, hundreds of thousands of crores, right? Uh, like or oh, hundreds of thousands of millions of rupees has been poured into dams. It's been spent by farmers. So, you know, even the wealthiest farmers are not like uh, billionaires. And, you know, uh, I think the number was 177,000 crores spent into port wells in, you know, a couple of decades. That's a lot of money, right? So that's been spent and still 60% of, uh, you know, only 60% of India gets irrigation of some form, right? So clearly money hasn't really moved the um, uh, needle that much. And if you look at technology, I spent, you know, I think four chapters talking about technologies from cloud seeding to um, air to water co condensers, desalination, drip irrigation, you name it, it's there. Right? It's not made a difference. But again, let me, for your example, one of the biggest wastes of water in India is the amount of crop loss we have in Indian agriculture, right? Again, we don't have a firm number on that, but most people say we lose between uh, 25 to 30% of our crops to just rotting, right? And it rots because we don't have good storage for it. So there is a startup that I talk about in the book that all he did was take these um, state-run warehouses, micro warehouses, and said, look, I'll manage them for you. And that was his business model. And because he partnered with people, um, he said, look, he told farmers, look, you come and store your grain in my warehouse. Anything above a 2% loss, I'll pay you for it. And let's not forget that losses tend to be 25%. So farmers thought he was nuts. But at the end of the day, because of how he managed the warehouse, you know, by using moisture meters, by packing correctly, by... Uh, you know, making sure that pesticides were used judiciously so there were no rats or other pests rotting the grain, you know, spoiling the grain. He brought losses down from 25% to 2%. And his incentives were aligned because only if the loss came down did he make money, right? So that's what I mean. I want to ask you another question about solutions because it's something that you spend a good chunk of the book, particularly towards the end, talking about. Uh, not just admiring the problem, as they say, but, but talking about solutions. You say that India has long ignored a crucial source of water supply that's sort of hiding in plain sight, right? You say this is a kind of secret weapon, the Mamashtra in our back pocket. Um, what is this weapon? And are there changes afoot that lead you to believe that India is ripe for exploiting it? Okay. So if we go back to how India's water varies, Right. It varies by geography, it's highly seasonal, it's temporally highly skewed, and then it varies across the years. So what's this magic source of water which overcomes every one of these uh, facets of India's water? It's our sewage, right? Because the toilets are in our homes, geographic variability doesn't matter. Because we use the toilet every day, it's reassuringly there. I mean, it's daily. It's not seasonal. It's, it doesn't vary across years. It's not temporally skewed. So it's literally the Brahmastra in our back pocket, right? And um, the sewage treatment plant that we have in our factories has made us, you know, breathe a little easier. If a come drought or, uh, you know, flood, those uh, the, the plant in one of our factories produces 12,000 liters of portable water every day beautiful water which we use in our gardens and um, if I look at you know before I wrote this book after I wrote my first book I said you know what this is an easy problem to solve uh, let's just get the right um, regulation we'll say bulk users manage your own sewage and we're home free right then I started writing this book and I learned that Bangalore has precisely this regulation since 2004. 
and yet bangalore has a flaming lake it has like a <laughs> lake from he- uh, like from he- literally hell which is foaming and flaming and flames because of the methane of insufficiently treated sewage so clearly that's a, a wonderfully visual reminder that policy can only it's necessary but not sufficient and you know again you go back to the respecting water there are a couple of studies that i've used in the book that say you know apartment complexes to whom this regulations aimed at when they um, when they are reliant you know they have experienced their own form of day zero and they are reliant on expensive tanker water they are very vested in sort of getting the technology right making sure it fits them and reusing the sewage but if apartments are getting you know free almost free bore well water or fairly cheap municipal water they're like you know what we'll do a we'll do we'll obey the law on paper but you know our true sewage treatment will not be as good as it could be if we were to re- really reuse our own sewage so i think you know it gets me very excited and it makes that makes me like not a great dinner companion because i start talking about sewage that's sewage but <laughs> yeah it's yeah i think my husband just loves that but um, what happens is you know there is actually a fight going on in a part of bangalore because there is a lake that gets fed by treated sewage and that's what keeps the lake whole throughout the year and recharging groundwater and then therefore keeping the neighborhood happy now there is a power plant that's coming and saying you know what we'll pay to upgrade your sewage treatment facilities and we'll pay for your sewage so this is like a very exciting part uh, this actually gets me excited because you know once you start getting wastewater markets going i think you're in a more hopeful future and i'm seeing that because there's a startup i just invested in that does precisely this treat sewage and sells it to industries i i think it's it's worth maybe ending on a hopeful note and, and so let me ask you this you know there are a lot of people who might be listening to this conversation who say okay this is a serious crisis i'm depressed about the future of india i'm depressed about the future of the sustainability movement um and maybe wondering you know what is it if i'm feeling helpless that that citizens civil society can do you know what what's your sort of sense of how can they be part of the solution uh, in terms of you know how they're leading their daily lives are there things that can be done that are really from a societal level as opposed to a kind of top down governmental intervention see the book is grim but almost half the book is with solutions right um it starts at home it starts with our factories it starts with the story of uh, rajendra singh who's brought 12 rivers back to life in a in one of the driest parts of the world let alone india right there is an uh, old colonel dalvi who's made his apartment water secure in pune and then gone on to work in uh, you know tens of villages making them water secure i mean there are water heroes that are profiled across the um, the second half of the book so i definitely think people shouldn't lose hope but to come to examples because of how varied water is i think a decentralized solution works best because what will work in Cal- um, calcutta will not work in delhi what will work in delhi will not work in uh, kochi right so it has to be customized and when you get decentralized the relative power balance between civil society individuals and the government sort of shifts a little bit because at at the municipal level a uh, a strong civil society a civil society organization a very committed individual or a group of indiv- individuals have real power and um, let me just uh, give a couple of examples you know actors like media the courts all of them start coming up so in madurai we had this we have a lake a 8 hectare lake called the teppakula it was dry as a bone so there is a photograph in the book of kids playing cricket on it and uh, one day the hindu and the tepakuram was where historically uh, goddess meenakshi and her consort go on a boating trip okay so uh, that gives you perspective so the the hindu wrote a uh, the hindu is a very respected paper they wrote an article saying this is what is happening and a high court judge saw it so he said if that's the last thing i do i'll make sure i fix this and he called the commissioner and the collector every 3 months and said you're going to fix this 
and it turned out there were so many encroachments on the channels feeding this lake with water and people you know how indian courts work so people would any you know the um, the corporation would say please clear out your encroachment and people would go file a case and it would drag on and nothing would happen but now everybody was uh working together there were a couple of people from civil society who were following this up the courts were vested the corporation was vested and fairly soon encroachments got cleared and after 40 years water flowed into the tepkaram and started recharging all the groundwater within so you know i think water resilience water security is certainly possible but i'll just ask listeners to ask themselves two questions to start their water journey first how much water do i use and where does that water come from and if you follow the answers to those two questions you will i think you know you will end up more water secure than you are today yeah i'm asking myself those questions and i'm feeling very bad about the <laughs> what the likely answers are uh my guest on the program this week is the author mridula ramesh she is uh the author of a brand new book called watershed how we destroyed india's water and how we can save it uh here is what the entrepreneur and businessman uh, anand mahindra had to say water is the defining challenge in india's battle with climate change this book watershed rigorously unpacks how we got to this crisis point outlining the risks and the changing realities that farmers cities and businesses need to contend with it lays out a workable scalable natural and technological solution that can secure water resilience while creating jobs india desperately needs um mridula thank you so much for coming on the show for sharing your insights with us this is a it's a wonderful kind of tour of the horizon for those of us who uh who are interested but don't follow this stuff every day you've made it somehow detailed but yet highly accessible Congratulations and, and thanks so much. Thanks so much for that. Grant the Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on hdsmartcast.com, India's fastest growing podcasting platform. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we reference on this week's episode, visit our website grantthemasha.com. Production assistance comes from Caroline Duckworth, Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff J. Pranada is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.